Hello and welcome back! If you follow the channel, you know that we have been restoring all kinds of Apollo Electronics hardware over the last few years. You also know that I was in Seattle recently and visited the Connections Museum, near the former Boeing airfield. And you might even know that at the other end of that historic Boeing field, there is another museum, the Museum of Flight. So today we are taking a lazy day off, not reverse engineering nor restoring any complicated Apollo electronics, but instead going to see some big Apollo hardware in the museum. I mean, really big. This museum is an amazing place with a superb collection of major aircrafts and aerospace items. One of the stars of the show is the sole remaining M21, a version of the Archangel a-12 aircraft, the early version of the SR-71 Blackbird. The M-21 had the unique ability to launch a supersonic drone that sat on a pylon at the back. You can also climb inside an SR-71 cockpit, and I was happy to oblige. And outside there is a whole bunch of stunning aircrafts, including a supersonic Concorde that you can climb into. But I quickly whizzed past the main aircraft collection and spent the day in the lesser known section of the museum dedicated to the space race, of which local Boeing was a large participant. But boy, it sure deserves to be more well known as it is one of the best presentations I have ever seen of Apollo hardware. I started a visit admiring a display case at the entrance of the exhibit. It had all the US rockets from the first manned spaceflight to the Apollo moon rocket, all at the same scale. From the Redstone and Atlas rockets of the Mercury program, to the Titan for the Gemini flights, to the Saturn 1B for the low Earth orbit Apollo flights, to the Saturn V moon rocket, which didn't even fit in the frame. Then it dawned on me that this entire evolution took place from 1961 to 1968, a mere 7 years. Compare that with the 17 years it has taken to fly the first SLS, and by no means on a small budget. Clearly NASA isn't quite what it used to be, but still, the Apollo program is an engineering achievement of outlandish proportions. That's one tough engineering act to follow and that display immediately puts things into perspective. That was going to be a good visit. I was then immediately drawn to the Apollo command module. This is CM007A. It started life as CM007, the very first production Block 1 command module delivered to NASA. After being upgraded for the Block 2 configuration, it became known as CM007A. It was still used for further recovery testing and training, including a 48-hour survival test where astronauts Jim Lovell, Stu Rosa and Charlie Duke spent 48 hours bobbing around in the open ocean in rough swells. It is beautifully restored and very well presented and lit and since it never flew, it is nice and shiny. The hatch has been removed, which is great because it allows us an opportunity to take a nice peek in there. As we walk around it, we can see the small side windows. There are also forward-facing ones. These are the rendezvous windows used for centering the spacecrafts visually in the docking maneuvers. There is a large window in the hatch, which we'll see in a minute. And let's go in for a quick look. On the top of the panel you have all the alarm lights. The center dials are for environmental control and cooling. I am making it to the bottom right portion of the panel, which is the communication section. In the still at the bottom left you can recognize the two large knobs for manual control of the high gain S-band antenna position. One for pitch and one for yaw. Above them are 3 meters, the middle one is the S-band receive signal strength, the one we wired up in our restore transponder. On either side of it are the S-band antenna pitch and your position indicators. Above them the 3 vertical meters are the cabin and suit pressure and temperature indicators and the CO2 partial pressure meter. Here's a better view of our high gain antenna control and meters. 
The calm section is obscured by a strut and I end up a bit too far right looking at the fuel cell and electrical control. It says main bus A and main bus B on the voltmeter knob of Apollo 13 fame. I'm trying my luck from another angle to see the communication section that Eric is trying to reproduce right now. Unfortunately the angle is a bit steep. I can see the squelch A and B thumb wheels but I can't discern much else. We end up in the number 5 side panel with the fuel cell pumps that they turn off for Apollo 13 and the cabin lighting controls. There are panels all over the place including in the lower bay. Here is an overall view of the right section with the lower bay panels. I have not researched what they do, but these would not have been accessible while the astronauts were strapped in their couches. Coming in from the other side, we have the propulsion controls, the prominent FDAIs commonly referred as 8 balls, and our favorite computer interface, the Disky, which is clearly a block too. Drifting to the alarm lights, the mission timer numbers are fake, it would be an electroluminescent display like the Disky. Drifting back towards the RCS maneuvering controls, it looks like the protective cap switches for the staging pyrotechnics have been torn off and were hastily epoxied back together. Now coming straight in, we go on a trip to the lower bay with the prominent sextant and telescope optics. There is a little cheat sheet for the guidance computer verb and nouns. The computer sits right underneath this section. There is another disk key to the right, that's the navigation disk key. This entire area is used to align the inertial navigation platform using star sightings, a process that is tightly orchestrated by the Apollo guidance computer. The Block 2 Unified Crew Hatch is displayed nearby, superbly presented and lit. It's unified because the heat shield part of the hatch and the crew cabin part of the hatch have been unified in one single outward opening hatch after the Apollo 1 accident. It is a marvel of mechanical engineering. There are 15 latches operated by a long linkage around the periphery. The locking and unlocking is via the long handle on the left. It actuates a ratcheting gearbox located towards its base in a pumping-like action. It takes about 5 pumps to lock or unlock. The golden selector on the gearbox selects whether the pumping action is set for locking or unlocking. There is also a golden safety pin on the side that will lock the gearbox and that you have to pull before activating the handle. However, it was designed to shear in the event of an emergency if you really crank hard on the handle. The round thingy at the right of the window is the venting valve to manually depressurize the cabin. You will notice that the center window has markings on its rim. They are used to monitor the roll on re-entry. During re-entry, the AGC rolls the entire cabin around to orient the lift up, down or sideways as it actively targets the landing zone. The astronaut in the center couch can monitor the roll by looking at how the Earth's horizon lines up with the marks. At initial re-entry, the horizon should be lined up with the zero roll mark. There are other markings for 50 degree and 90 degree roll, left or right. You can see some pretty good rolling action from this Apollo 15 re-entry footage, probably taken from the rendezvous window, not the hatch one with the markings. Now we turn around to see the mother of all engines, the Rocketdyne F1. These are of course the five ginormous engines that lifted the Saturn V rocket off the ground. I had never seen one up close, that engine is just huge. 
It stands at 19 foot tall. For you metric centric rest of the world, just know that this is so high there is no equivalent metric dimension for it. The diameter of the bell is 11 feet 7 inches. Same thing, too large to convert to metric. I am told it wouldn't fit. As I was craning my neck for the better part of an hour trying to understand the plumbing upstairs, a friendly docent finally came to me and asked if he could bring me a ladder. He was joking, apparently. However, if you are a little bit familiar with rocket engines, because you have watched enough Scott Manley or Everyday Astronauts videos, you'll be able to identify the main parts of this engine. The large pipe around the nozzle is for the gas generator exhaust. It injects a curtain of gas to cool the nozzle extension below it. It's still quite hot, but much less than the main rocket exhaust, so the curtain appears black when it exits the nozzle. Same as the black spots on the sun, that aren't really black nor cold, they are just less hot than the other parts of the sun. The thrust chamber, which is part combustion chamber and part nozzle, starts right above the big wraparound pipe. It is entirely lined with cooling tubes. The F1 engine is cooled by its own fuel, 70% of which passes in the tubes lining the chamber before being injected back at the top. Looking up at the top section, you can spot the bottom round part of the gas generator, which powers the turbo pump. The turbo pump itself is not easily visible, sandwiched in between the inlet pan way up top and the gas generator exhaust funnel underneath. However, you can easily see the output pipes carrying the high pressure liquid oxygen and RP1 fuel from the turbo pump to the combustion chamber. They are the two large horizontal pipes with no step written on them. The oxygen one is at the very top and the fuel one is underneath. Here I am zooming in on one of the attachment points for the hydraulic gimbal actuators. Only the four outer engines were gimballed, while the fifth center one was fixed. And if you are wishing to see more of the internals of the engines, you are in luck. For this you have to thank another local, Mr. Jeff Bezos. He funded an expedition to look for the remnants of the spent Saturn 1C first stages at the bottom of the Atlantic. And finding them it did at an incredible 4.3 km below the surface of the Atlantic Ocean, which is much too large to be converted in British Imperial units. Three miles below where I'm standing right now, is a wonderland that is testament to the Apollo program. It looks like a magic sculpture garden with all of these pieces from different missions that are in some cases perfectly preserved and in other cases twisted into these beautiful shapes. Here they are. So this is part of the thrust chamber of one of the Apollo 16 engines, starting from the left, the liquid oxygen inlet dome, a reproduction plexiglass injector plate, the fuel inlet annulus, the combustion chamber, and the first top part of the thrust chamber expansion nozzle. You can see all the cooling tubes I was just talking about. Up there is the bottom part of the turbo pump. That's the gas exhaust, which first passes through a heat exchanger to heat up the liquid oxygen and create gas to pressurize the LOX tanks during flight. The disc is part of the gas turbine, providing 55,000 horsepower to the pump. 
And here's the actual injector plate with the famous baffles that they had to add in order to prevent the engine from destroying itself in spectacular fashion because of combustion instability. Here is a cross section showing how the injector plates distributes the locks and the fuel from the intakes we just saw. And next to it is turbo pump turbine stage 1 removed from the exhibit we just saw. You can see it in this cutaway of the turbo pump, one of the bladed discs at the bottom. And that's how it was supposed to look. Thank you very much for fishing this out of the ocean, Mr. Bezos. Very impressive. But enough of engines already. Let's make our way to the lunar rover. This is of course a donation of another local company. Boeing is the contractor that developed the rover. I am of course immediately attracted to its color camera and the S-band communication antenna as we just got that bit working in our recent restoration of the Apollo communication system. Take note Elon, this is how a proper electric vehicle control panel is done. None of this flat screen buttonless rubbish. This must be a film camera. The super light foldable wire wheels were a point of pride in the design. And I was surprised how small the foldable S-band antenna was. They must have made some improvements on the transmitter to get enough signal to noise for color TV through an antenna this small. The camera is the later RCA color camera mounted on its robotic mount which could be controlled from Houston. And there was so much more to see. There is a LEM ascent stage which is quite a big piece of hardware. They also had an Apollo inertial measurement unit or IMU which had the gyros and accelerometers used by the Apollo guidance computer. And in a corner, the spare Mars Viking lander. But the museum was closing and you get the gist of it. If you ever are in the area and a space nerd like me, pay a visit to the Museum of Flight.